Good morning. Welcome to our worship service this morning. This morning is the 18th Sunday after Pentecost. We'll begin with our first hymn, Hymn 176. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children, but we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you, and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me, according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin, and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord.
Let us pray. Lord, we pray that your mercy and grace may always go before and follow after us, that loving you with undivided hearts, we may be ready for every good and useful work through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The first lesson for the 18th Sunday after Pentecost is taken from the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 50, a prophecy concerning our Savior. The Lord God gave me a tongue like the learned, an instructed tongue, so I know how to sustain the weary with a word. He wakes me up morning by morning, he wakes up my ears so that I listen like the learned. The Lord God opened my ear, and I myself was not rebellious. I did not turn back. I submitted my back to those who beat me and my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from disgrace and from spit. The Lord God will help me, so I will not be disgraced. Therefore I have made my face hard like flint. I know that I will not be put to shame. The one who will acquit me is near. Who can accuse me? Let us take our stand. Who can pass judgment on me? Let him approach me. Look, Lord God will help me. Who then can declare me guilty? Look, all of them will wear all like a garment. A moth will consume them. Who among you worships the Lord and listens to the voice of his servant? Anyone who walks in darkness and who has no bright light, let him trust in the name of the Lord and let him lean on his God. So far the Old Testament reading. We'll now join in singing the psalm of the day, Psalm 116. The second lesson for this morning is taken from the book of James, chapter 2. My brothers, have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ without showing favoritism. For example, 
Suppose a man enters your worship assembly wearing gold rings and fine clothing, and a poor man also enters wearing filthy clothing. If you look with favor on the man wearing fine clothing and say, sit here in this good place, but you tell the poor man, stand over there or sit down here at my feet, have you not made a distinction among yourselves and become judges with evil opinions? Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? However, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show favoritism, you are committing a sin, since you are convicted by this law as transgressors. In fact, whoever keeps the whole law but stumbles in one point has become guilty of breaking all of it. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says that he has faith but has no works? Such faith cannot save him, can it? If a brother or sister needs clothes and lacks daily food and one of you tells them, go in peace, keep warm and eat well, does not give them what their body needs, what good is it? So also such faith, if it is alone and has no works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith by my works. So far the epistle lesson. rise for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel is one of the gospel according to St. Mark chapter 8 beginning at verse 27. Jesus went away with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. On the way he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? They told him John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others say one of the prophets. But who do you say I am? He asked them. Peter answered him, You are the Christ. Then he warned them not to tell anyone about him. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the experts in the law, be killed, and after three days rise again. He was speaking plainly to them. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But after turning around and looking at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You do not have in, mind, in your mind set on the things of God, but the things of men. <clears throat> he called a crowd and his disciples together and said to them, If anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, We'll save it. <clears throat> so far, the gospel reading.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for this morning is the Old Testament reading from Isaiah chapter 50. The Lord God gave me a tongue like the learned, an instructed tongue, so I know how to sustain the weary with a word. He wakes me up morning by morning. He wakes up my ears so that I listen like the learned. The Lord God opened my ear, and I myself was not rebellious. I did not turn back. I submitted my back to those who beat me and my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from disgrace and from spit. The Lord God will help me, so I will not be disgraced. Therefore I have made my face hard like flint. I know that I will not be put to shame. The one who will acquit me is near. Who can accuse me? Let us take our stand. Who can pass judgment on me? Let him approach me. Look. The Lord God will help me. Who then can declare me guilty? Look, all of them will wear out like a garment. A moth will consume them. Who among you worships the Lord and listens to the voice of his servant? Anyone who walks in darkness and who has no bright light, let him trust in the name of the Lord and let him lean on his God. In the name of our Savior, dear children of God, Many times when people ask us what Jesus did for us, we will say that he has suffered and died and paid for our sins. That's a correct answer. But it's really not complete. Because if all we're going to talk about is Jesus' suffering and death, we're going to talk about a, a few days toward the end of his time on this earth. And we forget that really Jesus came for us totally, that there's 33 years of Jesus living for us. And not just living for us, living perfectly for us, sinless. Something that, that we really can't even imagine. Isaiah, in our text for this morning, gives us a, a little bit of a glimpse of, of what that was like for Jesus to live that way for us. Isaiah, uh, throughout his book, many times refers to the servant of the Lord. And, and, and it's out of this context, of, of, or the, out of this section of where we're reading. But that's who Isaiah is talking about, the servant of the Lord. The Old Testament people would have known him as the Messiah. We know him as the Christ, or Jesus. And so as we look at these words that are before us, we're going to see the servant of the Lord and his perfect life. A life he lived in obedience to his Father. A life he lived for you and me. Now we read in Isaiah, the Lord God gave me a tongue like the learned and instructed tongue, so I know how to sustain the weary with a word. He wakes me up morning by morning. He wakes up my ears so that I listen like the learned. Over the last number of weeks, we have looked at uh, many instances where Jesus is teaching, and we, we realize that Jesus was a masterful teacher. We could easily say the greatest teacher that was ever here on this earth, and, and what made him so great is he simply came to share with us what his Father in heaven had told him. But Jesus did more than just listen to his father and tell us what his father said. Jesus did what his father said. In fact, as I said before, Jesus willingly, perfectly carried out his father's will. We read, the Lord opened my ears and I myself was not rebellious. I did not turn back. Jesus came really with one purpose in mind, is that save you and me from our sins and give us heaven. And so he came to this earth to, to live the life God as Father demanded. Perfect. And then to suffer and die and pay for our sins. And we dare never think that that was just easy for Jesus. No big deal. No, it was hard. Day after day after day, attacked by Satan, attacked by the Pharisees, the Sadducees. And when it came to his suffering and death, that was no walk in the park. But Jesus says, I was not rebellious. 
I didn't turn my back on my father and say, no, 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 I'm, I'm not going that far. I won't do that. No, Jesus, day by day, carried out the will of his father. After his resurrection on, on Easter Sunday, he was walking with those Emmaus disciples. And he said these words. He said, did not the Christ have to suffer these things and to enter his glory? See, Jesus did what his father wanted him to do. And he did it willingly. Think of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. What, what did he pray? He said, my father, if it is not possible for this cup, that is everything that's going to happen to him, to, to pass from me unless I drink it, may your will be done. These weren't just nice sounding words that Jesus said and, and then did something else. No, Jesus went forward to carry out that will of his Father. He says in our text, I submit on my back to those who beat me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from disgrace and from spit. We all know what happened to Jesus. We can list those things off. <coughs> We can think of, of, throughout his life, attacked by the Pharisees and Sadducees, uh, attacked by all different kinds of people, and then the, the physical things that happened to him in his suffering. But he did not sin, not only physically, but also mentally. And did you ever think about that? Jesus did not sin in thought, in word or in deed. Just think of this example. If somebody does something to you and you do not retaliate physically, maybe because you realize, I really can't. Do you retaliate mentally? Are you calling them names in your mind? Are you wishing bad thoughts on them in your mind? Are you angry in your mind? And, and if they could read your mind, they would be really upset with you because of the things you're thinking and saying about them? I think we've all been there. And yet not Jesus. Willingly carrying out the will of of his Father in heaven. But even more than that, he set his own will to the will of his Father. The Lord God will help me, so I will not be disgraced. Therefore I have made my face hard like flint. I know that I will not be put to shame. See, not just willing, but wanting. The will of Jesus was exactly the same as the will of the Father. They are one. And so we read about Jesus when he was here on this earth, when the days were approaching for him to be taken up, Jesus was determined to go to Jerusalem. And God the Father had laid out the plans of how he was going to save us. He, he knew those plans before they even were laid out to us and with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And Jesus, his son, was sent in this world to carry out those plans to the nth degree. And Jesus, being God, knew exactly what was going to happen to him. And yet, we're told, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. You know, if you have a, a doctor's appointment that you aren't looking forward to, we'll do anything maybe to get out of it. If we're going to go to the dentist, well, we really don't want to go there because they're going to drill our teeth and we try to stay away. If there's things going to happen in the next week, you're thinking about them right now and in a way you're starting to think, how can maybe I can skip that? Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen to him in Jerusalem. And yet he was determined to go. Did he deserve all this? Did he, did he deserve the, the temptations that came his way as he lived for us and the, and the attacks of the Pharisees and Sadducees and the suffering and the death at the end? Did he deserve all of that? No, Jesus had lived a perfect life. 
But in a manner of speaking, we could say yes. Because he willingly took your sins and my sins upon himself and was willing to pay whatever payment was needed even though he had done nothing wrong. We read in our text, the one who will acquit me is near. Who can accuse me? Let him take our stand. Who can pass judgment on me? Let him approach me. Look, the Lord God will help me. Who then can declare me guilty? Look, all of them will wear out like a garment. A moth will consume them. Jesus had no sin. He, he once asked the people around him, who can uh, convict me of sin? No one could say a word. But to suffer, to live, to die, not for himself, but for you and me, is why he had come. While he was hanging on the cross, he said three very important words. It is finished. It really, his resurrection put the, the exclamation point at the end of those three words. As Jesus rose from the dead, everything was said, it is finished. God the Father, his plan had been accomplished. Everything was accomplished. There was nothing yet for anyone to do. The perfect life had been lived for us. Jesus had suffered and died for us. Everything was accomplished. And so we read in our text, Who among you worships the Lord and listens to the voice of his servant? Anyone, anyone who walks in darkness and who has no bright light, let him trust in the name of the Lord and let him lean on his God. See, the word listen there doesn't mean just to let it in one ear and to go out the other ear. It means to let it in your ears and then into your heart to listen. To understand that Jesus has done it all for you. But there is that little thing in inside of each one of us that doesn't totally grasp that. I have to do something. There has to be some kind of payment that I have to, to do to God. You know, God has done all this for me, and now I owe God something, don't I? I have to earn my way somewhere. We're used to that. We have that saying, you never get something for nothing. And yet that's what Jesus did. He was once asked that question, what should we do to carry out the works of God? And he answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in the one he sent. Or in the words of our text, let him trust in the name of the Lord and let him lean on his God. Jesus has done it all. Heaven is yours. And what God wants us to do is look to Jesus, to trust in Jesus. And as we do that, we begin to follow him. We listen to his word. And we, we bend our will, even though sometimes we think we know everything, we bend our will to God's will. We live a life that pleases Him, struggling every day, not because we're willing, but because we want to. And if we have problems, if we're tempted, well, the Bible tells us because He suffered when He was tempted, He is able to help those who are being tempted. So trust him. Lean on him. 
When you fail, he will forgive. And as you follow, he will strengthen. Jesus has done it all. Our lives become lives of thank you, of praise. To thank a Savior who has lived and died and paid for our sins. Amen. Now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. And I'll confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We'll now place the offering on the altar. We come, O Savior, to your throne to give you of our treasure, moved by your love which on the cross was given without measure. Your love for us, paid out in blood, purchased our salvation. Help then our love reflect your love till we live with you in heaven. Amen. I now ask you to turn to page 42 in the front part of your hymnal and join me there in the responsive prayer of the church. Page 42. Also this morning, we pray for Mr. Paul Douglas, who is in the hospital. We pray. Lord God, our maker and preserver, we praise and thank you for all that you give us day after day. We are not worthy of all the mercy you show us. You have given us your precious word to nourish our souls and to protect us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. We thank you for those who teach and preach your saving truth at this place and everywhere. Grant them a rich measure of patience, wisdom, and love. Heavenly Father, we pray that you shield us from every kind of danger, sudden catastrophe, terrors of crime, and the pain of disease. Watch over those who travel by land, sea, and air. Keep our loved ones from whatever perils may threaten them. Bless our land, our people, and those who hold offices of high trust. Keep our government and schools upright and strong for the advancement of good citizenship and useful vocations that we may enjoy your gifts of peace, security, and well-being. O Lord, you are the great physician of soul and body. You chasten and you heal. We pray that you would look with mercy on your servant, Paul Douglas, in his illness. If it is your will, spare his life and restore his strength. You gave your son to bear our infirmities and sicknesses. Deal compassionately with your servant and bless the medical means employed on his behalf with your healing power. We commit him to your gracious mercy and protection, for you are a faithful and merciful God. We now ask you to hear us as you bring our private petitions.
We bring these requests before you in the name of Jesus, our Lord, and ask you to hear us. Take all that we have, our bodies and minds, our time and skills, our ministries and offerings, and use them to your glory. We give ourselves to you, that we may serve you in whatever way is pleasing in your sight. Amen. We join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you.
God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation. And bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. one of you, a special welcome to those who are visiting. We're very happy that you're here. Uh, please come again. Uh, one new thing that's coming up this week uh, that I, I, I would like to encourage as many of you as possible uh, to attend is midweek Bible class. And the reason is, is that this is uh, a, a really, we've, we did this class back in, I can't believe it was that long ago already, 2015, six years ago. And it, and it was a, a great class. Uh, those who attended really enjoyed it. And now we're going to do it again. And, and the reason I want to do it again is it, it's, it's very basic. There, you, need, you need to come with no other knowledge. You don't have to come with any kind of a foundation or whatever the case might be. Basically what this Bible class is, is we're going to read the Bible. It's, it's a book called The Story. Uh, a pastor took the, the Bible and, and wrote it in story form. It's, it's, a, it's very well done, uh, but it takes out he said and he said and all these different kinds of things. Uh, but you read it chapter by chapter by chapter. And um, it's, it's, we'll have classes on Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. Uh, we'll watch a, a video uh, for about 10, 15 minutes uh, at the very beginning. Uh, then we'll open it up to whatever questions you may have. And uh, then at the end, we have also have some questions that we can talk about that, that I'll have. 
but if you have the, 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 the time and the opportunity to do it, I would encourage you uh, to, it, it, and it's not even a class, you have to be there every week because all you have to really do is read the chapter and you, I think after a couple lessons you'll want to be there because it's just, it's good discussion. Um, those of you who have the book now already, the books are not free, you can take them. There's, there's a number of them in the back. I just ask that you sign up when you take a book. But um, read chapter one, those of you who will be there, uh, and we're gonna be talking about the creation and the flood. And, and that's what chapter one is about. So again, the encouragement that if, if you always said to yourself, oh, I should go to Bible class sometime, it'd really be interesting, and I'd like to do that. This would be the class to attend. Uh, very basic, but at the same time, uh, very interesting. And please sign up and, and grab a book on your way out if you'd like to come. But every Tuesday at 7 o'clock, we will meet and, and to continue on through this book. Otherwise, it's the last Sunday of the month. We'll watch The Wells Connection. I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. Just a few weeks ago, delegates from Wells churches all across the country met for our Synod Convention, an event that's held every other year to celebrate our blessings and plan for the future. I hereby, in the name of our triune God, call to order the 66th Biennial Convention of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod to order. My name is Mitch Capel. I'm a lay delegate here at the convention from St. Paul's Church in Amherst, New Hampshire. Uh, this is my first convention. I think it's definitely uh, an exciting thing to be a part of this process, to have a hand in the future work of our synod as we go along. I have great confidence and, and uh, enthusiasm in the, in the future of our, our synod and all the great work that, that everybody here is doing and everybody has a part in. If this year's convention looks a bit different, that's because in addition to the 100 in-person delegates, more than 200 delegates attended virtually via Zoom. But the process remained the same, with elections, presentations, and planning sessions for the next two-year period and beyond. Highlights included a proposal by Home Missions to establish 100 new mission starts in 10 years, beginning in 2023. It's a bold plan that reflects growing new opportunities for outreach in North America as we see more and more people who desperately need the gospel. There's just a natural desire as you see people sort of drowning in, in the sea of all the ideas that are present in our world to say, I know something that anchors me in all of that and I, I want other people to have that too. So you might say, well, World Missions reported that while COVID temporarily slowed our work in Vietnam, our online mission work grew considerably as we developed innovative new ways to train workers around the world, nurturing new Christian communities in distant lands. It also is a way that we can reach out with the gospel into places where we simply cannot send missionaries. Ministerial education highlighted the rapidly increasing need for trained workers in public ministry and how Martin Luther College is meeting that need through a major campaign to upgrade campus facilities. We simply must provide a campus that speaks to the prospective students of the 21st century. Right now, we have opened up the service builder software. The Wells Commission on Worship offered a presentation on the new hymnal, noting that preliminary copies will reach churches this month. Congregational services detailed the launch of new ministry resources for congregations with practical applications for evangelism, discipleship, stewardship, even family devotions. The past two years have been some of the most challenging that many of us have ever faced, but it's also been a year of unforeseen and undeserved blessings. We're reminded that no matter what the outward circumstances, God works to build his church. As situations change, new opportunities arise. And together, we can react to our changing world by reaching out with the one thing that doesn't change, the gospel message.